Well, you wouldn't have known that was our first time to sing that song, would you? You know, sometimes that's what we need is just a peaceful touch of the Lord. There's times we need a shout and a jump and a run and, and a crying and a laughing and everything else that goes with it. But there are other times also that you just need a good, peaceful touch, calming presence of the Lord. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you, that He gives us that. Uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 2. While you're turning there, I just want to take a second here and, and appreciate Brother Lowry for something uh, he does that you may not even know about. Brother Lowry is very active in a prison ministry and has been for quite some time and uh, was not able to do it for quite a while because of, the, of COVID, but is now able to do it and uh, messaged me this week to let me know that he would be asking for prayer, of course, that he would be speaking to the uh, inmates again. And was it three of them? He, he messaged me last night or yesterday and said that three of them came forward at the altar time, at the invitation to, I guess, give their lives to the Lord. And I appreciate that so much. Amen. He is quick to let them all know uh, including the authorities, that, he, that this ministry that he does is, is a ministry out of this church. He lets them know that, that it's an outreach ministry of this church. And so you, you have a part in that as you pray for him and encourage him. You have a part in that. I just wanted to say how much I appreciate that and the effort that he gives because it's easy to not do those things, especially now, and that's wonderful. Well, you tell them the rest of it. <laughs> I may not know it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he stole my sermons, what he did. <laughs> he stole my sermon. <laughs> but that's all right. I, I'm happy and glad that, that that's possible. Amen. The Lord uses these words in lots of different ways, doesn't he? Whether it's a song like that, or whether it's a sermon preached, or a lesson in a class or something that's okay. Let the Lord do His work. Amen. I noticed tonight every song that was sung, the choir songs and the two songs that were sung up here, I paid careful attention because I knew what I was going to talk to you about tonight and I wanted to, I just kind of want to make a mental note of it. And every single song that was sung tonight, in one way or another, referenced two realities. Every song referenced a current, present situation or reality of the here and now. But then it talked about or looked forward to another day and another time and another promise that God gives us of a great and glorious day. Amen. And that's a whole lot of what this lesson is about tonight. And so here's what we're going to do. If the Lord will allow me to... I'd like to get all the way through chapter 2. There's a lot of verses, not a lot, but there's quite a number of verses in this chapter. And we won't always move this fast in Isaiah. We will of necessity have to slow down some as we go. But I hope we can tonight because as you will see, a lot of the verses are expounding on the same thing, particularly the judgment of God upon the ungodly. But let's do this as a start tonight. Let's read the first five verses of this chapter together. Isaiah chapter 2 beginning with verse 1. It says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it, or unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem." And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, 
neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Some of those verses you're familiar with about learning war no more. You've heard those and, and quoted those maybe for years in your life. And this is the context in which we find those words written. Now let me give a little bit of a prelude, if I can, to this lesson tonight, just as a reminder of how we sort of approach Scripture when it comes to the prophets, these books of prophecy, as contrasted to, say, a, a gospel or an epistle of the New Testament. The, the books of prophecy are written very differently. The prophets are used of God very differently, and it's important to know how, and certainly it's important to know how Isaiah uh, uh, shares with us and the visions that he gives. And that is this, that the prophets are constantly moving in and out of the present reality and the future promise. And that's what I was talking about a moment ago when it comes to these songs, a present reality and a future promise. You know, we sing these songs, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. That's a future promise, right? When we all get to heaven, that's the future promise. But we also know that we live in the here and now, and there are struggles in the here and now. And that's how the prophets moved and flowed under the anointing of the Spirit and how they wrote their prophecies. They would talk about a coming day when God will make all things right. They talk about a coming day of the Lord in which righteousness shall rule the land, as Isaiah does here in this chapter. But they also make note of or reference the fact that the present realities are the reasons why there is going to be a future day and there is a need for a future promise. And that's important because when we start this chapter out, chapter 2, we start this chapter out really with a look at, at the millennial reign, a look at the future day when it's going to be grand and glorious. But we don't go very far. We just get past this fifth verse where we read, and then Isaiah comes, flips back, if you will, into the present reality and where Israel is and, and their sinfulness before God and their abomination before the Lord. And it's because of that present reality that God gives the promise and reminder that his plan will not be thwarted, but he will come through with what he has promised. And so chapter 2 begins that very way. It begins with Israel's future and the ultimate purpose of God. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Now, clearly, in that verse and the va verses that follow, he's talking about Jerusalem. In fact, he uses the, the reference Zion here. He's talking about Jerusalem. There is coming a day when Jerusalem is going to be the center, the focal point of all things righteous, all things good, and the center of attention for all of the world. Folks, that's, that's one of the reasons why as Christians today, we need to always pay careful attention to what is happening in Israel. You've heard me say, you've said it, we've all, we all know it. It's, it, it all started over there and it's all going to wind up over there. And that is this great promise. There is a day coming. I don't care how bad it gets, and I don't care how bad it looks, there is a day coming, hallelujah. And that's the, pro uh, the promise of the prophet. The prophet's glance has penetrated into the farthest future, and he gazes on the glory of God and his people, and it is believed that what Isaiah is describing here is a reference to the millennial reign. Israel's future, once again, will be realized in the purposes of God. Can I tell you right now, presently, Israel's present is not now realized in the purpose of God. Israel's in rejection right now of his son Jesus 
who died on the cross to save them and the whole world. And this Isaiah is a reminder that there's a day coming when the purpose of God will once again be realized for Israel, his own people. Now, I don't know why God chose. I don't know why. I know he did it. But I don't know why God chose to reach down to speak to one man, Abram, and out of that one man and out of that one family build and raise up an entire nation and through that nation bring us his ways, his laws, his uh, precepts, and eventually to bring us Jesus Christ, the Messiah, into this world. God chose them for that purpose. He chose them to be his vessel. So Israel's purpose is not their own. It has nothing to do with their nationalistic dreams. Abraham was to be a father of nations, a blessing to the families, to all the families of the earth. The Bible tells us in Exodus 19 that Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests. The specific purpose for God bringing Israel to the forefront, raising them up as a people, is to fulfill His purpose in them. So what's happened? What went wrong? Where did they go astray? Well, it sort of began a long time ago in 1 Samuel chapter 8. I mean, it may not have begun then, but it reached a, it reached a terrible turning point then. And that is when Israel said, we're not satisfied with God ruling over us. We're not satisfied with God being our leader. We want a king like all the other nations of the world. We want to be like all the rest of the nations, and we want a king to rule over us. And they went to Samuel, and they put forth their demand, give us a king. I preached not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, on David. And how David was called, that shepherd boy, and how God raised him up and brought him before Samuel. And Samuel said, this is the one God has chosen. Well, it was that God gave them their request. It was not God's purpose. It was not God's plan. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and 5, they said to Samuel, now make us a king to judge us like all nations. Some of the saddest words really in all the Bible. And then just two verses later, God speaks to Samuel in verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And he gave them what they wanted. You know, God will let you do what you want to do. It won't be good sometimes if we reject him, but he'll let us do it anyway. And and that's where Israel really began to take a serious turn for the worse. Almost all their struggles and decline would follow this desire to be like all the other nations. That's where it all started downhill for them. But we open up Isaiah chapter 2, and we read that after all the centuries of struggle, indeed all the millenniums of trouble, there's a time coming, there's a promise coming where the city will be redeemed and the kingdoms of the world are going to decline and perish and Jerusalem has an abiding place in God's future. I want to say that again. Right now even, it doesn't look like it. It doesn't appear to be that way, but Jerusalem has an abiding place in God's future. Amen. Amen. And that's what Isaiah is telling us. The city will be prepared to be God's instrument, to have his presence, to have his dwelling place. Literally, God will dwell In this city. Man, that's incredible. That's amazing. And in that day, the rulers of the nations are going to be forced to come there to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. 
You know, I thought about that today, and I thought about this G7 summit they just had, where they all oh, they just they posed for the cameras and 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 I you know I I don't know I shouldn't feel that way I guess it's not just the G7 they also have I think a G12 or something a G11 you know where the where the great leaders the great the prime ministers and leaders of the greatest nations on earth come together and and oh isn't it something. But there's coming a day when the G7 and the G whatever is going to make a march up there and they're going to acknowledge God in Jerusalem and the righteous ways of God. Amen. And bow before him. Hallelujah. What a great and glorious day. And that's what he says in verse 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. There will be pilgrimage after pilgrimage after pilgrimage that will come up to Jerusalem to see and know and hear the ways of God. Man, you look at this present world right now and you look at that and you say, no wonder we sing these songs and no wonder we rejoice and clap our hands and get excited because there's a great chasm in where we are right now and where we're going to be one day and how glorious it's going to be, praise God. That wonderful promise. And only God can bring this about. The United Nations can't do this. They can't bring this about. The United Nations has proven how weak and powerless it is. It can't even bring peace on earth. Can't do it. By the way, that's the one entity that keeps slamming Israel every time they defend themselves and stand up against aggression. The United Nations has only resulted in increased dictatorship on the earth. We don't have peace in the world, but we're going to have it one day. This day that Isaiah talks about. And what is this new city and its purpose? Well, it's going to be centered around God himself. His attraction to the nations and people is so great that they come to the summit of the mountain to learn about the God of Jacob and the lessons which Israel and Judah turned a deaf ear to. Did you know the only reason the church exists to this very day is because his own people rejected him? That's the only reason there is a Gentile church today is because his own people rejected him and he turned to the Gentiles and shared this great love with the whole world. Well, so it is also with Israel, his chosen people. They rejected and have rejected his plan and his purpose turned a deaf ear to it and the nations of the earth will one day come to where he is in Jerusalem and they will learn from God and one of the things that they will learn and know is that the age of peace has come and there won't be war anymore and so much so that in verse 4 he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The implements of war won't be needed then. They won't be needed. Won't be any nuclear warheads, smart weapons, won't be any of that. Man, I tell you, I've been watching some stuff on TV of the technology of war, where it's going. I don't know if you pay attention to that kind of stuff or not. It's real boring to my wife. It's real boring to most people. But I kind of like watching that stuff. And I, I, watched, I watched a documentary the other night. I actually had the footage of this. And it's been in recent years where one of our, uh, one of our planes went up and released at, at, at mid-flight. They released a whole... A bunch of these little small uh, drones. They weren't. They they were very small little drones, and they they were like bees. I mean, they opened the hatch, and there were dozens, if not hundreds, of them that came out of this plane. And when they came out of this plane, I mean, it showed it happening, and and they had all the you know the Pentagon leaders there confirming it and everything. It, once they got out of that plane, they weren't just falling. They 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 came to flight. 
and they group together. And I don't know if you've ever watched, I don't know if you've ever watched these birds that fly sometimes in groups, in coveys in the air, and, and how they'll be all moving together, and in, an, and, and in an instant they'll turn and go another way and then swoop down and swoop up, and there might be dozens of and hundreds of them. That's what these drones did. They were learning from one another, and, and they were learning what to do and how to react, and, and different signals would be given from the command center that they would respond to and then ultimately they had these uh, these uh, manless uh, sitting duck uh, uh, tanks if you will for the express purpose of seeing what would happen and those drones would fly over them and absolutely destroy every last one of them I mean, it's, it's amazing. That and the laser technology that's happening, it's, it's incredible at the technology that's taking place in the last day as it relates to war. But there's coming a time, won't be any need for any of that. Won't be any need for any of it because we will learn war no more. Won't that be great? Amen. Now then, in verse 5, he says, O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. In other words, since we know this is coming, since we know this is going to happen, shouldn't we walk in the light of the Lord? Shouldn't we want to please God? Shouldn't we want to serve Him? That's what he's saying. The view of the future should cause us to walk in the light of the Lord. It's the only way of peace because when you leave God out, you don't have peace. It can't happen. It won't happen. For all their great purposes from the days of Abraham forward, Israel was not what it was called to be. What a difference between that which Israel shall be And what it actually is. And Isaiah reveals that. Now, there's a reason for it. This is not just happened. This is not just, you know, the passing of time, circumstance. There's a reason Israel is not the people God has called them to be. And that they have been. There's a reason why America is not what it has been. We may be stronger militarily than we've ever been. We may, have, we may have smarter technology than we've ever had. But in the soul of this nation, we are not what we have been. And there's a reason for it. And Isaiah points it out starting in verse 6. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east. And are, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols, they worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made, and the mean man boweth down. And the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. And when the prophet says, therefore forgive them not, what he's he's really saying and, and how that word is to be interpreted is, they're getting what they deserve because they've turned from God because they wanted to be like all the other nations of the earth. And so they've borrowed from all the other nations of the earth. Not just wealth and physical and material things. They've borrowed from the nations of the earth. From Assyria and from Babylon and from others. They've borrowed even in matters of religion. And they've brought them in and they've adulterated the true faith of God. And they're worshiping idols, the works of their hands. That's why Israel is a shell of the people they have been, Isaiah would say. You know, I thought about this today, and I don't know about you, but I have, so far in this study of Isaiah, I just can't get past looking at America, at the United States of America, in in a very similar way to how Isaiah is looking at his own people. I know we're not Israel, and I'm not trying to say we're Israel, but there's some uncanny uh, similarities between us and them. And I thought about it today in light of our history, you know. 
There's a reason why we put in God we trust on our money. There's a reason for that because we've always trusted in God and always looked to God as a nation. I'm going to tell you that wouldn't happen today. That would never get passed today. You wouldn't get that printed on the money today if it hadn't been done a long time ago. It wouldn't happen. There's a reason why we have, we have, the, uh, have had the Ten Commandments. In a lot of our public places, a lot of our judicial buildings, it's a reason for that because we've always looked to God and we've always founded our system of, ju- uh, of justice and, and, and uh, the way we go about life itself upon the precepts of God's Word. We've always done that, but we're getting away from that now in the same way that Israel has. If the Lord will let me in the near future, I'm, I'm kind of just beginning this. But I want to talk to you in the near future about this whole cryptocurrency thing. And what's happening with all of this uh, techno money. I'm telling you, it's all paving the way. It's all paving the way for a one world system, for globalism. You can't hear enough about globalism these days. And it's going to be a financial system. It's going to be a system of economy. It's going to be a religious system, just exactly as the Bible has said it's going to be. And I believe, I believe it's very possible, if not highly probable, that this whole cryptocurrency thing is going to be a big, big part of that. And hopefully I can uh, gather all of that and share it with you in the near, near future. We are buying into that as much as any of the nations of the world are. America is. And so they, Israel, had adopted new ideas, worshiping the creature more than the creator. And listen, they'd become quite rich doing it. They had become quite successful as far as gold and silver and wagons and horses. I mean, that's what we just read in verse 7 and 8 there. They've made it as far as the world is concerned. In other words, Their desire to be like all the other nations, well, congratulations, Israel, you did it. But you're poorer than you've ever been, Isaiah says. You you better watch what you ask for. You better be careful what you want because you might just get it. What a shame for great men to think that bow and women... That bowing before God is somehow below them, but yet they will bow themselves down to a tree stump or a carved out rock, but won't bow themselves down before the living God. This is the complaint that God has and that Isaiah has for the people. So once again, God is stung into righteous judgment. You remember what was said in chapter 1 and verse 4. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. His people have. And so what follows in these verses and most, well, not just the remainder of this chapter, right on into the third chapter and right on into the fourth chapter is that God, the Holy One of Israel, is going to judge His people. Isn't it wonderful that Isaiah starts out with the promise of the millennial reign and one of these days the holy mountain Israel is going to be the habitation of God? Isn't it wonderful that he starts out with that But he tells us why that matters so much because of the present reality of where Israel is. They've rejected God. So from verse 10 all the way through into the next chapter is the awful description of God judging his people. And so much so that in verse 21 it says that they're going to go into the clefts of the rocks and under the tops of the ragged rocks for fear the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Man, you think about that. You think about the words that Isaiah uses there. When God will shake terribly the earth. I wouldn't want to be a part of that. 
the vengeance, the wrath, the judgment of Almighty God. And Isaiah tells us the same thing that Revelation tells us in Revelation chapter 6. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and the every bondman and every free man, all the G7 or anybody else, hid themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? I read, I read one man's remarks today. I got a little chuckle. He said, I don't know if men, I don't know if mankind has ever been cavemen before, but they're going to be one day. And they are. They're going to run into the caves and dens of the mountain and hide themselves from the wrath of God when he judges this evil in the world. So all you see today, all you see today, has to do with political economy, has to do with government, commerce, art, the pride of man, and the religion of man. But the day is coming when all of man's pride is going to be brought low and the Lord Jesus will be exalted in the earth. That's why you better be on the right team. You better be on the right side. Amen. God is not given his proper place today in the governments of this world. He's not. He's not given his proper place in society and business. And when he comes, he's going to come in a way that the men and women of this earth are going to run. And they're going to hide themselves from his wrath. Look at verse 20. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to moles and to the bats. That's how much gold will be worth. That's how much all the wealth of this world will be worth. They'll throw it aside to the creatures, the critters of the earth. That's how much it will matter. And verse 21 says, again, when he arises to shake uh, to terribly the earth, and look at verse 22, cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Now, what does that mean? Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. What do you think that might mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means that you and I exhale. We breathe out. And we don't know whether we're ever going to inhale the next breath. All the breath we got is in our nostrils. All the breath we've got right now is what's coming out of us. There's no certainty that we'll ever take another breath again. That's just how frail man is. That if he misses one breath, he's out of the picture. He's gone. Don't put your trust in men, in kingdoms, in systems, in institutions of this earth. I don't care who they are. Don't care. They've only got the breath they've got in them right now. That's as much as they've got. God's the one we put our trust and confidence in. Multitudes today are going about their daily business that will suddenly disappear from the earth's scene. So you put your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ where it belongs. Amen. So when you look at this second chapter really beginning from verse 6 all the way to the end of the chapter is that description of the judgment of God upon this wickedness, this rebellion, and the people's response of running and hiding. It's all going to come, and that's how the chapter ends, what we just read in verse 22. Cease ye for man whose breath is in his nostrils. That's why we kind of could say tonight we're going to try to cover this whole chapter because all of these verses from chapter 6 following are just, each one is just another description of the judgment of God. It's coming, church. It's coming. And I believe there will be revival and renewal in pockets throughout the land for people that are hungry and thirsty uh, uh, from the Lord. I believe that. 
But that's not going to negate the fact that the judgment of God is coming. And there's going to be a great day, that great millennial reign, when all the nations of the earth are going to go up there to Jerusalem. They're going to travel up there to Jerusalem and learn the ways of God, and there will be no need for war again. Amen. Stand with me, if you will. And so we get, a, we get a decent start tonight. We can say we've got a decent start in the book of Isaiah. I promise you, and I have from the beginning, that some of the most glorious passages and promises in all of the Bible are found in the book of Isaiah. The most glorious promises of the coming Christ. Unto us a child is born. Some of these great promises that we cling to come to us right out of this book. What a glorious book it is. But it is a book filled with these kinds of prophecies as well, that God's not going to tolerate evil, and He's not going to tolerate unrighteousness and rebellion and rejection forever. You believe that? So how many, how many love Him? And how many want to stay tuned, amen, to Him? Let's thank Him for His Word tonight. Lord, thank You for the revelation of what it shall be for the promise that Isaiah started with tonight that there is coming a day hallelujah that day of the Lord and oh Lord we see the present realities around us and they make us want that day and long for that day even more may that day be the strength of our lives and the hope that we live for I pray in Jesus name amen amen Lord bless you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, buddy. <laughs>